freaking bad. Wrestle me. Welcome, everybody, to the JP Dub, the second episode in this wonderful series where we go outside of the pro wrestling world and get into the entertainment world. That's right, where we talk to people who are directors, they are composers, they're artists, all walks of life. Anybody or anything that entertains you, that's what we're going to be bringing to you occasionally, and it's called the JP Dub. And with Juice, which is myself, and Sretton today is a very special guest. If you guys are familiar with uh, the Juice Pro Wrestling Podcast, you know we're big horror buffs here. And um, coming from the 80s, one of the big cult hits that's still really big in uh, a lot of circles today is Killer Clowns from Outer Space. And we are very proud to welcome the guy who is responsible for one of my favorite uh, soundtracks pretty much to any movie, let alone just horror, um, John Masari. What's going on, John? Well, a lot's going on. I'm, I'm honored to uh, be a guest and uh, on your show. And, and I'm, so I, I know you guys are big wrestling fans. I haven't kept on kept up with wrestling since I used to go see Andre the Giant at the Olympic here in Los Angeles a million years ago. Oh, wow. So I, I'm kind of like so out of tune. Uh, but my grandfather was a big Freddie Blassie fan. So yes. I used to watch wrestling with my grandfather. But as far as what's going on today, I don't have a clue. <laughs> but um, um, but it's an honor to be invited uh, by y'all, and um, I'm ready to answer any questions or dive into anything you want to know about. And no topic is um, uh, uh, there's no topic that will offend me or be off limits. Sweet. Well, I'm ready to rock and roll, so let's get down to the yeah. gritty. We're, we're ready to offend. Hopefully I, hopefully I won't regret what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. Well, I'm I'm actually very excited, John. Again, Sretton here, thanks for doing this interview. Um, I am also a huge fan. Um, I know Wallace and I first connected. Um, we have kind of different musical tastes because, you know, he's mm-hmm. the lead singer of a band. He's into, like, harder stuff. I'm a Dave Matthews band guy, but... I mm-hmm. love motion picture scores. I really do. I have like mm-hmm. growing up, I collected them. Um, you know, I'm a I, w- I was a fan of like the M Sh- Night Shyamalan stuff, but like the '80s stuff, it didn't. What a I twist! Didn't, it I didn't catch on. But like recently, when right before Wallace told me you were going to be a guest, um, I for some reason like was listening to the 28 Days Later soundtracks for the the 28 Days Later and 20 Weeks Later, mm-hmm. and I was like, man, for some reason, if it's it, uh, a lot of so there's different genres that have good scores, but for whatever particular mm-hmm. reason, the musicians that create the music that goes in the background of horror movies are just, they're just better. Like you oh, got yeah. like Michael Bay movies where he get, he's got the same guy that does stuff. Shyamalan does the same stuff. John Williams, a composer, does a bunch of stuff. But it's all like, that stuff is all like patriotic, symphonic, huge. But like for some reason, horror movie music is usually mm-hmm. much more creative and catchy and will like get stuck in your brain. So when he told me that you were going to be a guest, I got extremely excited. So I will let Wallace tell ask the next question, but I just wanted to say thanks, man. I'm like I'm going to jump out of my chair. I might jump out the window. <laughs> He's marking out hard. Okay, yeah, cool. I'm marking marking out as cool. they say pretty hard, so. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty awesome to have a, a composer on here. I myself, John, am a huge, absolutely huge Frank Zappa fan. Um, what's your oh great? What's your take on uh, the man, the myth, the legend, the mustache? Oh well, you know, um, I, I really appreciate Frank Zappa. I appreciate his uh, independence, his um, striking out, you know, blazing his own trail. Uh, I was very fortunate one time to spend like about six hours with him oh and tell a, the story um, tell yeah it. but it's not like i worked with him it's just i sat there and watched watched him work oh. we I, I i just finished working on a uh, a little film that he really liked the animation uh, that was in this film and he just wanted to meet the filmmaker and the uh, the filmmakers that made the film including me mm-hmm. and um the guy who directed the film really didn't know what or who Frank Zappa was. So it didn't matter to him. So he said, you know, come down to this editing bay. I'm editing one of my concerts on video. This is back in the old days when you were like in a big editing suite. There's a bunch of technicians that were 
mixing the sound and editing the picture at the same time, it was a very expensive. I mean, it'd be the equivalent today of like three or three thousand dollars an hour, yeah, kind of thing, you know. And um, so uh, I, I just basically watched him work and was very impressed with how diligent he was and how professional he was. His wife came by and brought a bunch of pies for everyone. And um, I, I just I just love his music because he doesn't have any filters. Right. And um, it's hard to do that. I mean, you strike out on your own and make your own music and wait for the response from the listeners, which is what he had. He had a, a fan base that just loved what he did because he was so um, he, he was lacking filters and boundaries and what have you. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you work professionally in the media industry, um, you know you can, you really can't get away with that. I mean, basically, you're you're you get a laundry list of things that people want to hear, and um, if they like your sound, like let, let's say you, I go I go on a limb and try to do something super original, there have been people that have said, "Well, I really like that. I don't understand it." but I really like it, uh, and I want it in this project. There are other people, no, no, no. Uh, their approach is like, uh, here, I've, I've listened to this product, this this movie, we call them products. Yeah. Uh, we like, we heard the music for this movie, and it seemed to do well. Can you do something like this? And, you know, you, you got to pay your rent. Yeah. And, you know, you go, okay, uh, yeah, I think I can do that. And, and you just get like so dissed for it. Like I, I'm friends with, uh, as a matter of fact, I went to school. Uh, we went to school together. Uh, we weren't exactly in the same class, but we were, at, we were in school at the same time. Uh, was Chris Young? And uh, there are times where people will play one of Chris Young's soundtracks. Can you do something like this and put it in our movie? <laughs> and oh boy, I just get lambasted for it. I mean, you know, the the IMDb hatred is like very severe and it happens with a lot of composers you know if you dig deep and listen to some soundtracks of some film composers you can tell where they're getting their major influences from yeah but uh very happy to say that it wasn't like that with killer clowns from outer space which is which was very wonderful because i was working with a, a team of film uh makers namely the Kyoto brothers yep. that were artists that they said they wanted to do something, do a movie like no one's ever seen that they would like to see. Um, and they were, they're were basically doing it to satisfy their own um, curiosity. Yeah, yeah. And thankfully, it's over the years, it has just grown on people. And I think that's what happens when you do something, you know, cream rises to the top, you know. Um, I, I know it's funny to say that about Killer Clowns from Outer Space, but when you think of it, because the guys were so original and they weren't trying to cop something else or trying to imitate anything else, um, I think they're rewarded by um, a fan base and a following that has like grown in generations over the years. So yeah, and we're what thirty um, years now. I think this is we're coming up, if I'm not mistaken, on the thirty-second year. Mm-hmm. I knew yeah. it was somewhere around there. I mean, I've been watching it for over 20. So. Yeah, it, it was released in, I want to say, um, in 1988, the summer, uh, spring of 1988. How long had you, how long had you been composing before you were, uh, before you were asked to do this? Uh, well, uh, I had logged in a lot of flight time, uh, before I did Kill the Class from Our Space. Uh, prior to that, I was um, working as kind of like an apprentice composer for um, TV, old TV series that were out. Like while I was in high school, these TV series were well established. There was Little House in the Prairie, and uh, then there was Heart's Heart, which was uh, Mark Snow, and Mark Snow actually Mark Snow who did the X Files later yeah. on. Yeah, but but before that, he was doing it. Of all kinds of um, TV series that were produced out of 20th Century Fox, and, um, and he, uh, I just cold called him. There was a day where he had the musicians' union 
um, membership book. You can actually call someone and nine times out of ten get them on the phone. So I had heard his music on one of the TV series, and I asked him if he needs any help. And he and he said, well, you know, send me a sample of your work. And back then, what you did is you sent a cassette with a score, like a Xerox copy of whatever score of that music was, so the composer can not only listen to it, but see that you wrote it. Right. And, like, look at the manuscript. So they wanted really they wanted to see the written music. Well, yeah, because you would be writing wow. music. Yeah. Because basically, you see a scene, you have to you tinker musically with it, you have to write it down, and you bring it to uh, an orchestra or a, or a group of musicians, whatever it is for that right. particular show, and they have to play it, and it has to be basically either they sight read it and record it at the same time, and then that gets broadcast, or they play through it once and record it. And um, usually, I, I mean, I've been on recording sessions where the musicians will look at it and they'll say, I'll say, how do you feel about this? Do you think we could just like run it, just record it? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's not rehearsal, it's just play it. And now with um, uh, non-destructible, um, you know, in the Station. digital world yeah. where tape is not an issue at all, there's no, back oh, then there was man. tape. You had to, they were you cutting could, and you pacing. Run, you would get, you would get, they would get really upset with you if you took too many takes and start. They had to keep rethreading the machine with new, new tape stock because tape stock was, you know, actually, tape stock was relatively expensive, but uh, space on a hard drive is not as expensive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but even today, there'd be times where musicians look over the part and say, "Yeah, yeah, this should make a run through." And back then, they used to do it, uh, do it that way also. So you, so I, I, I sent it through the mail. They had to wait like two days, you know, uh, for the thing to be delivered, or you could send it special delivery. And then you wait like a week, and you make another call and ask if, uh, you know, if you got a chance to listen to it. I think with Mark Snow, I think he he was so busy, he could he could figure out in just a few minutes, like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing. And I got a call back from him, and he, I I got to meet him in person. And usually personality is very important. So you got to figure out if you can get along with someone. And so we kind of hit it off. And he said, he just gave me stuff to work on. You know, here, here's a VHS and here's uh, uh, the description of the scene where the music starts. And you've seen the show, right? Yeah. So, okay, go ahead and do it. And so uh, the next week I came back and he liked what I did. And little by little, I, I started doing full episodes and then I would do episodes under my own credit. And the same thing happened with Hanna Barbera. Johnny um, Quest. For yeah, Johnny Quest and, and also did the Smurfs and there was nice. Richie Rich yeah. Richie Rich. And what else was there? There was one other one. There were cartoons that I never followed. I did follow Johnny Quest and the Smurfs. For some reason I used to catch the Smurfs every once in a while. <laughs> so um and it was interesting because uh, if you ever come to Los Angeles, um, there's a street that runs by the Hollywood Bowl. You keep going for a while. And before you come to Universal Studios, there was Hanna-Barbera Studios. Now it's no longer there. It's a uh, um, like kind of like an industrial park slash residential area, mm -hmm. right? So I, I, uh, I quite by accident got a call from the music director there. His name was Hoyt Curtin. Now, Hoyt Curtin wrote the uh, uh, Johnny Quest theme. He also wrote the the theme to the Flintstones and uh, Top Cat and all these other TV series that were really big hits. And he said, uh, he, he based, you know, he to me, he was an older guy. He was like in his 70s. I mean, to me, he was like my grandpa. You know, he says, listen, I listen to your music, and I'm really not impressed by people, but I can tell you, you know how to write. Come on in. Let me. I'll show you how to do this thing, and we'll see if you can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, uh, I can. So, handle it. so he he showed me the technique they have. It's very simple. You know, we give you a storyboard, and you're gonna get, here's a cassette of the voiceover. The voiceover is gonna be a, the exact length of the animation that's gonna follow on this storyboard. So you, ne I never got a VHS of the animation of what it looked like, and you kind of time it out. Right, I'm getting kind of technical. I hope this doesn't bore the crap out of no, you. No, I love I love this shit. 
so I had so I, you sit there with like a stopwatch and you kind of like figure okay, uh, the and the, you you figure out the timing of the dialogue as it relates to the storyboard, which has the dialogue printed uh, under the pictures, the drawings of the animation in sequence. So you kind of like time everything out. And then you go, okay, I gotta, I'm going to write a piece of music that will work over this. And so, it's, all in your imag- it's all in your imagination. Yeah, so you write so based on I, instinct, but also based on the rhythm of the initial recorded dialogue, right? It's not the final dialogue. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Or right, it right. is. No, it is the final it dialogue. It is the final dialogue. No, no, they, they, yeah, yeah. They, it is the final dialogue they put with it. The voice actors are the ones that have been there forever. So here's what's interesting. So he says, do as much as you can. And we'll see what it sounds like, and then we'll uh, we'll take it from there. And so I did as much as I possibly could. I, I, I covered as much as I could, and I always pick the hard scenes, the ones that have the most uh, transitions in them. Not just like a scene where, like you know, someone's walking into a room, and then the music's going to stop. It's got to be something where something interesting is happening. So I did a bunch, and I came to the recording session. Well, here's what's funny. I was there, and I noticed. I had my, you know, satchel with my scores, and it had already been copied. And then there was like 15 other composers with satchels and scores. And I thought, oh wow, we're probably doing a lot of episodes. Nope, this is episode one. Jeez. Is, oh, oh yeah, this shit. is the audition. And he would play through pieces, literally play through the first three measures, and he go, okay, um, this isn't gonna work. Next one. And and then guys were just like going home with their heads bowed down. <laughs> now they. Most guys had definitely wanted to speak. I had done like 12. So he recorded all 12 of mine. And so then he says, okay, uh, send me an invoice. Uh, you get paid this much per page. And uh, we'll um, uh, come come over tomorrow morning and we'll give you the next show. And so I was on the show, Johnny, the, the new Johnny Quest, I think is what it was called. Yeah. So I was on that for like maybe like six months or something like that. And there's a lot of people working on this. There was, um, well, you may have heard of him, John Debney, yeah, who uh, did Passion of the Christ. He was doing them also. I mean, we were all sitting there trying to bang these guys out, and we record. We would record, by the way, at Universal Studios when they had a big sound stage, mm-hmm. and that was really cool to show up on the Universal lot, and then some other independent studios that were relatively um, popular at the time. I think there's one that's still open called Evergreen Studios, where um, that used to be owned by Barbara Streisand, I believe. Ooh. And um, that was a really great studio. And that's one of the few studios that you, you can record with an orchestra that's still open space. I probably sound like this old guy from the old days of Hollywood to you guys. No, <laughs> but I still, I, like I, I still do a lot of stuff. I still work a lot. A lot of it still works a lot. I mean, basically, I'm the same age as people that you know, like Hans Zimmer and um, who else uh, that's really popular, like Thomas Newman. We're all about the same age. We've all been yeah, Thomas Newman this does all the shaman stuff. Fact, with right? Hans Zimmer, I was just at the Hans Zimmer studio the other yeah. day for an interview of, regarding some other project. Well, I always um, threaten here again. I always wondered how uh, – it, it, one of the things I'm fascinated by is – so access to music and your ability to create, especially with film or um, maybe not so much cartoons, but certain types of animation is easier now as far as, you know, let's say like in the 80s, 70s, whatever, um, or, or during Hanna-Barbera's like extreme heyday, like it took an it army to create something. It took a lot of people to create every aspect of, especially animation. Right. I'm not talking about film. Yeah. Film right. did the same thing, right. but when it came to music, like they, like people didn't fuck around. It was full orchestras it was like it was and nowadays what i'm fascinated by is so now you have better access but the budget for a lot of the like the stuff that it takes to make a film if you're not a big budget film um like Uh the budget on everything is is like borderline non-existent so when somebody has to compose i feel like so that's kind of what like one of the things i would like to get your angle like what you think is like the difference now in 2019 when you're composing a piece for a piece for for whatever you need to compose for um you know you know you sit in your what i'm assuming a home studio or if you have your office or whatever mm-hmm. with your laptop and mm-hmm. your musical samples versus back then when you write a piece and you would write something that's anywhere between like 5 to whatever 100 pages i don't even know um and the difference mm-hmm. because now you might be doing everything by yourself 
until even like creating the you know a, a, a few pieces of music uh, versus back then when you would write it and somebody would have to like the way you would get a sample is you would get a full orchestra or a, a significant number of musicians to record the piece and then show it to somebody like what is that big difference that's I guess do you understand what I'm trying well, to ask I hope well I, I know exactly where you're coming from and I, I I heard everything that you said. And I understand everything you said, and I will respond to that. <laughs> but let me just tell you, while you were talking, I ate some potato chips. <laughs> <laughs> and I hopefully, hopefully, while you were talking, it didn't sound like something was crunching. So I don't know. I didn't, if we didn't hear it at all. We, we, shack, we you like may want to like take that out. Let me ask so, you this, though, John: okay. What kind of potato chips so were I, they? I know exactly what you're talking about. So okay, I I will <laughs> use an example. Of a project I just finished not too long ago. Um, Sam Raimi uh, yes. uh, has a. I call it. I call it the Sam Raimi crowd. There's a a, a, a group of filmmakers. They're really a, so competent and so so um, wonderful to work with. I say competent. When I say competent, I don't mean they they, they can barely. They're just pros. They're really professional people. That mm. you know, they work on a schedule. They they say what they're going to do, and they actually do those things. It's like it's really flawless to work with them. And uh, so the director I worked with was from Sam Raimi's bunch of uh, pals that make projects all the time. Um, is um, uh, um, Josh Becker. And uh, Josh Becker, he did, oh gosh, the thing that I know that is really popular for is doing the uh, Xena Princess Warrior TV Ooh, show. yeah. Like that. Okay, so he just did a Western, just a full-on uh, Western. And, it, you know, when you see it, it has a bunch of familiar faces. I think Sam Raimi's brother's in it. Yeah, Ted. Um, yeah, and then, um, uh, and so I was approached to do that. And it was very interesting because uh, Joe Loduca, who does most of um, Sam Raimi's stuff, was just completely unavailable. Mm. And and so they were very um, – they got a recommendation from uh, a friend of theirs that you go, well, you can, you know, call John Massari. He, 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 he can do the – he can do a Western. <laughs> yeah. and, the, and they called me and they said, you know, we know you as the Killer Clowns guy. I mean, how do you do Westerns? I said, well, I cut my teeth on – Little House in the Prairie, with, <laughs> right? Did with, not uh, know this with David <laughs> Rose, who, who did tons of westerns, including, yeah. you know, Bonanza. So, oh, if you're looking for a classic western film, I can give you that. And let me give myself a little plug. You can look on my SoundCloud, and it's one of the playlists. It's a movie called Warpath. So they said, "Listen, the first thing they said, and I was really surprised that they said this, and and they're not going to mind that I give you kind of in." inside information. So the movie is called Warpath. So the first, the group of people I talked to is the producer and director. First words out of their mouth, what's this going to cost us? <laughs> you know, that's the, you know, because it's show business. They go, what's this going to set us back? And I go, well, you know what? Let's, let's, let's do it this way. If, if you've got a couple of weeks to wait, uh, if you don't mind, let's not focus on what it's going to cost. Let's, focus on, you know, is this the right music? And if you give me a couple a week or so, I'll I'll do the opening title that will take us into the movie and we'll set the pace for the entire movie. How about that? Uh, and they said, okay, all right, we'll do that. And then we're going to talk about how much it's going to cost. Yes, of course. So basically my uh, philosophy is I want the people to like the music, not like the price that it's going to cost them, right? Yeah. Uh, not not what they're going to pay. So I did the first. Uh, oh gosh, it was like literally four minutes, you know. And there are times I just finished uh, doing the same thing on a on a project that I'm still waiting to hear from. I didn't just do four minutes. I did like in twelve minutes, you know, three different scenes that were about four four minutes apiece. Um, so, anyways, I did that for Josh Becker in this. Western called Warpath, and they immediately called back after they heard the music. Said, "We really love it. How much is it going to cost us to do the whole movie like this?" And I said, "Well, that was done with samplers. That was done with my 
setup that here. I, I work what's called in the box. I guess you can call it a home studio. But I, all, all the software and everything that I need is in virtual instruments and uh, audio processing uh, plugins. So uh, I have enough experience thanks to all the great engineers and uh, that I work with over the years that have given me tips. And it's taken a while to perfect it. It's taken a good six or seven years to come up, actually, excuse me, maybe 10 years to really get it down where it sounds wonderful. I mean, I listen to things I did 10 years ago. They sound pretty good because I used to send my stuff out to engineers that used to make recommendations and walk me through how to do it so that I can come up with a great uh, production sound. So I told them, I go, well, if we, if I do the whole score like this, it's going to cost this much money and I'll need to be paid that much money over a period of at least three or four months, because that's how long it's going to take me as a single individual, because I'd done several budgets for them. I told them, here's the budget with an orchestra and we can have it done within this amount of time. Uh, you know, a short amount of time. And then here's the budget with me doing it all samplers, but I get help from other uh, programmers that will take my music and perform it and what have you. There's, and then there's option C, which was the cheapest, which is having me do it. However, it's going to take you all this time to do it. And uh, they went with the cheapest option. That's just the way it, they they went. I go. I would recommend doing it with a real school, with a real um, um, orchestra. Orchestra for several for several reasons. Um, one of which is that every everyone here in LA that will be playing on my session has an average of ten thousand Instagram followers. Yeah. So they're all going to be like going Google Gaga. They're playing on a Western at whatever studio we're recording at, and you're going to have that much more um, social media awareness about your film. And uh, that just didn't seem like... <laughs> that, that, didn't, that didn't phase them. So anyway, so, so I had to sit down and crank out the score. And I had a wonderful time doing it. Uh, and, but I, I think I could have done... Um, just as good a job in half the time with a real orchestra uh, because there is a, there is a level of I would say each piece I mean if I had to strike it down like how much does it cost to how many days how, how much time does it take to do one minute of film in the way that you'll hear when you go to that sound club when you hear that hear that score I would say it's practically almost three days per minute to like come up, you know, not only write, but perform, then record, then mix and master a piece of music. So there's like several levels. And what's frustrating to me, I, I will I will reveal to you, <laughs> is that I have to keep changing hats. Yeah. I would like to be in one hat in my composer mode. Yeah. And not be the composer and then the musician and then the yeah, record the producer. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There's three different there's three different um, uh, ways of thinking, and when I compose music, I'm not thinking about how I'm going to record it. I'm thinking purely from a musical standpoint, because let's say if I'm doing something that's very orchestral, it's going to be in this case, it's, I'm using this one movie as an example. It's a western, and it's uh, when you listen to the soundtrack, you're going to say, "Wow, this is a western. This is not something else trying to be something else. This is a western." <laughs> So while I'm when I compose, I compose like a, a, a piano score that has maybe four if familiar with music, just like four music lines, four stabs, right? Um, and uh, so it has to, and I play it on piano, and it has to work timing wise and compositionally in that simplistic form, just like if you're playing a piano piece. Once that's established, then I go into orchestration mode where I figure out what, you know, is this going to be played by the string section and then the brass are going to be doing this and percussion are going to be doing that. I make all those decisions after the, after the composition is done, much like a script. I mean, if your script has a great story, 
you know, the, the, the blocking out of the story and the characters and the exposition and the, the poetry and parallelism and all that's all figured out. It's just a matter of getting really good actors to act the part, you know, and the and movie's kind of like, um, it's, it then becomes a joy to produce the movie because you've got a great script. The same thing here. If you've got a great composition, it be, then becomes a joy. You're not like trying to make up for anything afterwards. Like let's say, well, I'll make it up for uh, my, my composition sucks, but I'll make up for it with um, or great orchestration and then a great production. <laughs> you know, yeah. if you start off with your core composition being substantial, then it's a joy to, to start orchestrating it. And then after it's orchestrated properly and all the instruments sound very good and they're in their place, then it's a lot of fun mixing it because it kind of, everything kind of lays into, lays into uh, its own, uh, everything drives in its own lane, so to speak, where your, um, you know, your final uh, product, your final piece of music is something now you can enjoy just listening to. You're not analyzing it anymore. It's it's doing all the things it's supposed to do to to work with the scene and and be emotionally present. So do you? Do you guys fall asleep? No. Do you guys fall asleep? No. So do you? No. Okay. So do you I didn't do you know f- if I was boring you to death. Oh, yeah. we're wide awake, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could be, so in 2019. You could be you know, ch- killing yourself. Do you feel so, like? Anyway. Do Do you feel like it's so? Be, because because in in modern in modern day whatever in 2019, um, mm-hmm. it, it is asked I think of most people, um, in certain creative worlds to be to become a person that has to wear a, a multiple hats. Yeah. Um. Do you find mm-hmm. that because you're able to wear multiple hats, it's easier to get work? Um, even though you might like exhaust yourself, borderline kill yourself to do work because you're not mm-hmm. just doing one thing. Um, and do I, you like? Do you really give a shit, or do you like it both? Like, are you one of those people that's like, oh man, it's 2019, I got to hustle a lot harder, or when I get a job, I got to work way harder? Um, or do you kind of mm-hmm. you, you appreciate both worlds? Like, is are you you know have you adjusted? Um, do you prefer one over the other? Um, you know. I, and then we'll get into the killer clowns talk. <laughs> sure, but, sure. But I am curious um, about that. You know, uh, I, I love it all. That's all I can say. Okay. I, I love work. I That's love, what it seems I like. I love it all. It's not, not like I, I, you know, like when I was doing the score the way I described to you, uh, uh, no one was saying, gosh, you know, dad always pissed. You know, wasn't like that. I, and, and why am I like that? Because I enjoy making music because... Every time I delivered a new piece of music, I got feedback saying, you know, I really like this. You know, this is really good. Uh, there was only, a, in this particular movie, there's only a few spots where uh, they said, you know what, can we hear, you know that theme that you had, you know, six minutes earlier? Can we can we put that in at that spot? And I go, well, okay, sure, you can do that, you know. Um, so uh, it, it's, I, I think... Uh, Ken Gillette said, you know, if you can, if you can do anything that you do that brings joy to people, you're, you're accomplishing something great. So that's kind of the way I look at it. Now, do I want to do that all the time? No, especially under like horrible deadline situations. No. I mean, that's where I have to like put my foot down and say, listen, if we're going to get this done in three weeks, I need 15 people to help me do it. And, and that's, and, and that's true. I would need 15 people to help me do it. But since we're doing it over the period of four months, yeah, I think I can do it all myself and uh, enjoy myself at the same time and take a day off from time to time. So, um, no, I don't beat myself up about it. I'm very thrilled, uh, thrilled about it. To be <laughs> quite honest with you. Hell yeah. So now that we got all that out of the way, John, since you uh, did not put me to sleep, um, I want to tear. Oh, good. I want to tear a little bit more into. Um, uh, killer clowns as far as what was it like i mean that was your first kind of foray into horror though right oh well, let me think I, I i think it was i think I, I think that was my first horror film and i didn't i don't think i did another full-on i don't know if you call it a horror but a thriller mm-hmm. i did a thriller called uh ring around the rosie mm. um and then Something. Oh, and then the Cell Part Two, the sequel to the Cell. Okay. Which is an interesting story. 
I can go to. But um, uh, because I really like the first cell, and um, I'll just say this really quick about the cell parts too. So the script was really cool. I really like the script. And this is why I don't like reading scripts is because then when I finally got the movie. Because then you um, want a part, right? Was edit. <laughs> What's that? I said then you want a part, right? I, I did, did a part in the movie? No, I said you don't like reading the scripts because you like it and then you like, hey, you know, I got a handsome face. Let, let me jump on one in this thing. <laughs> right. Well, here's what happened. <laughs> so I see, the, I look at the movie. Once they they go, go, this is the director's assembly. Mm-hmm. This is the first cut, and it's. I go, okay, great. But usually, a director's first assembly assembly has is pretty long. Mm-hmm. A, that means they put everything in the movie, and then they're going to figure out how how to reconform things and to make it interesting and recut it and all that stuff. So I look at it and I'm like shocked. I'm going. Then I looked at my script. I'm looking. Wait a minute. Let me let me call these. Let me call the producer who was a friend of mine. And I said, "Where is page uh, 28 to 43?" He said, "Oh, we didn't shoot that." <laughs> and I go. That's the best part of the whole. That's what makes this entire movie work. Is that those were the most riveting pages. Yeah, we 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 just couldn't do it. And so that's why I don't like to read. Um, uh, read scripts before because I have this this weird expectation. I, I start visualizing what the movie is going to be like. I, I almost rather see the movie just cold. So right. anyway, back to Killer Clowns. Yeah, that was the. <laughs> I think that was the first. I guess you, I guess you can call it a horror movie. Um, now, you know? before going into this movie, uh, did you have uh, any like history of like personally of like? Do you like horror movies? I mean, I know you've worked on them because it's a paycheck. But... Mm-hmm. Um, like growing up mm-hmm. or anything, was there anything like maybe the old school Universal monsters or anything like that that kind of right. tickled your fancy? There's nothing like a great horror movie. There really is nothing like a great horror movie. And anytime I can work on one, uh, I I would like to. There's some horror movies that I've seen that boy, I wish I had worked on. And I I liked. Uh, there's a horror movie that uh, Pal and I and Barry McCurry did called uh, I think it was called The Boy. Yeah, the boy. I like that. That was pretty good. Yeah, that was so fucking. Cre- Excuse me. I oh, I, I, what word. the fuck are you doing now, John? Come uh, on. Okay. Oh, that movie's creepy. <laughs> that movie's creepy. Now you're gonna get thrown off of YouTube. Ah! That was so. That was so damn creepy. That was so creepy. I would have loved to do that. It was good, but um, the what rubbed me wrong in that movie, like it was creepy. I was wondering where it was gonna go, and then it was just like some mongoloid in the walls or something, and I'm like, oh. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> yeah. It's still creepy. It, it was yeah, good, you know, though. It, I, I will still say it's, it's a good a, film. It's a, t- it's, t- it's, it, you know, the concept was creepy. Um, you know, I, I don't know if they did a sequel or not or what have you. That's always a good sign. Um, Joe, uh, Joseph Bashara, who does all of the um, Insidious. Okay. Is that what it is? Insidious Universe. Mm-hmm. I love all those. I really like what he does. Christopher Young always gets the good shit. He always gets the good shit. <laughs> you know? And um, so, uh, yeah, you no, know, no, I, I, I like it. I mean, uh, am I a fan in, the, in that I buy masks and models and posters and stuff? No, I don't I don't even have stuff. I really don't. The stuff I have from Killer Class from Outer Space is like things that people gave to me, you know, like T-shirts and stuff. So right. I just don't have yes. enough room for it, you know, for you know, I do have, I do have like some toys, but it's, they're things that people sent to me, right? And um, you know, they asked me to sign for them and things like that. But I think it's all cool. I think it's really great. It's fun to go to the Kyoto Brothers Studio and see all the stuff that they're working on. They have, they, it's not just Killer Clowns stuff that they have there. They have all their new projects. They always do something that requires models or figures of of all sorts. You mean you you wouldn't know? You would look at some of the the newer things that the Kyoto Brothers work on, and you would never know they um, uh, that they do um, practical uh, th- that they do anything else by Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Oh, it's like okay. completely different. They they you know it's like me too. It's like there are times where I have to do uh, all kinds of different music, and I have to learn to fall in love with that style. And, and then and they go for it. <clears throat> and then they know. do the same thing with uh, visuals. Like I don't know if you saw uh, Dinner with Schmucks, 
they did yeah, all these yeah. uh, little, uh, yeah, they did all those little dioramas. It was really okay. awesome, you know. Very awesome. Um, but yeah. uh, so, and and to me, like Killer Clowns was. I mean, it's. I'm a big horror comedy guy, and you were talking about Sam Raimi. Obviously, those guys, mm -hmm. you know, Bruce Campbell and all of them were huge Stooges fans. You know, the slapstick. Oh I, yeah. I wouldn't really yeah. call. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say Killer Clowns is like slapstick, but it's definitely got that mm -hmm. like comedy vibe in it, like that. Mm -hmm. I, I hate to use the term cheesiness, because there is sure. some, there's some. Maybe it's a little cheesy or it's a little goofy, but there's some like brutal shit to go off of in that movie. And especially mm -hmm. the number one point is there are people, and I don't know the technical term for it, but there are people out there that are deathly afraid of clowns. So it's, mm -hmm. like, it's like this. Yeah, I forgot what it's called. It's, it's, it's a type of phobia that the name is the clinical term escapes me that they just don't like clowns at all. And, uh, uh, yeah, there's there's that, and I it's funny because I was at the very first screening. I, I'm you know, to me, I was sitting next to uh, Steve Chiaro, um uh, mm. one of the creators, and I, and I told him, I go, you know, I just I thought it was just a guy sitting next to me, and I said, that clown scared the shit out of me when I was a little kid. I, <laughs> I used to go to the circus, and I I don't know what purpose they had. They were not amusing, and they were not funny. They were very uncomfortable to be around, and you you just want them to go away. Mm -hmm. You want to be as far as you want to be as far away from them as possible. And we've gotten, you know, filmmakers of Killer Clowns have gotten um, a lot of criticism from the clowning community that we gave clowns a bad name. Uh, uh, John just, Wayne um, Gacy did uh, a worse an, job. An episode that. of Basket, <laughs> you know, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the series on uh, FX. There's a series called Baskets, and it's about a guy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jack Galifianakis yeah, and the uh, Between Two Friends Right, guy. right. Yeah, yeah. And he, he was telling someone in, in in a in the locker room, he says, maybe we should give up on clowning because, you know, he got these movies about killer clowns, but he didn't say from outer space. <laughs> and, like, who, who wants to be part of that, you know? So, um, yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I, I've seen uh, there are some people in the clowning community that have a certain style that I like that's mm -hmm. it's cute. You know, and then there's the ones that are just like, it's just grotesque. And it's just, I, me, I don't get clowning. So I guess that's why I had no problem working on a film that was uh, portraying clowns as aliens from outer space. Yeah, I loved it. I loved all the, the effects in it. And and for that day and mm -hmm. age, I mean, there wasn't there wasn't really shit for CG. I mean, even when you get to uh, what mm -hmm. was the one scene where he's doing the hand, uh, the hand shadow, and it, it comes up as the dinosaur. Right. Like, right. That shit was awesome, and it came off. It's still, to me, in this day and age, with all this millions of dollars of effects and CG, you know, you watch movies like mm -hmm. Avengers, and it's like, that shit doesn't mean nothing. Because if you watch Killer Clowns, it's like, wow, man, that still holds up. It looks really, really good. Yeah. And I miss the there's fact a, that there's, there's not a, there's a lot a, of there's, practical. There's craft to it. There's yeah, There's a lot yeah. of craft that's put into it. And there was a lot of cool ideas. The cotton candy cocoons. I love that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oh man, this so much of that. Like I say, it takes me back to my childhood because I I was watching that movie like super young, probably when I shouldn't be watching it, but mm -hmm. I did. I did. What it. sort of uh, John? What sort of direction threatening here again? What sort of direction did the filmmakers give you when you were trying to figure out like how did you guys come upon the sound for the movie or the you know? Well, I, I just know that. Um... The Killer Brothers were really fan, were fans of classic horror movies and science fiction movies, like mm -hmm. The Day the Earth Stood Still yes. and yeah. King Kong, and they loved that <clears throat> that classic uh, because it, it was based. I mean, all that music is based in the classical literature, so to speak, right? And um, so they wanted that compositionally. They wanted it to sound like that. Were, were you but, familiar in that world compositionally? Like, were you familiar with like writing music that sounded like how oh. they wanted to sound? Given, I mean, I know yeah, you were doing yeah. stuff for like the TV shows, but um, I mean, this is—I yeah. mean, it's a different thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and I'm familiar with those sounds. I, you know, I, of course, I I listened to uh, King Kong, the classic King Kong again. I'm saying, oh my goodness, that sounds. I hear a little bit of Mahler, and I hear a little bit of uh, uh, Gustav Holst, uh, you know, and I hear all. These various composers 
that uh, they they were influenced by, not copies of, but you could just you could just feel it, you know, in their music. And um, so they said we want you to follow that compositionally, but sonically we want it to sound really interesting, you know. And so if you can use synthesizers and other kinds yes. of instruments to get some interesting sound, that would be that's what we're looking for. So that's what I did. I just used the synthesizers of the day and um, some samplers uh, uh, to, that had very interesting sounds. You know, around the same time, um, you know, uh, the movie Predator. Um, yeah, Predator. <clears throat> yes. They yeah, had a the, great, the original, the, the Predator had a great score. The original score. Predator. Oh, yeah. Da, 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 okay, da, da. Are you guys, you guys going to edit this afterwards and take all the goofs out? Or are you, you're there are no goofs, man. Wow, this has been great. Know? Yeah, yeah. I okay, was actually, okay. actually going to um, ask a question um, that might end up derailing everything as soon as you get done with your point. Um, because there's been a resurgence of – well, i just go ahead and ask. Um, so there's been a resurgence because of Stranger Things – and uh, be right. even before Stranger Things came out uh, through the internet and all these streaming services, there's been like a resurgence of like synth. 80s synth music. We got a Hammond right and, behind uh, us. <laughs> yeah, we have like a Hammond oh, piano wow. behind us, uh, uh, electronic piano behind us, like in the studio um, that Justin got his hands on. But my question was like, uh, and like I said, this is where I risk uh, 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 asking a dumb question: Was Ooh. do you hear do you hear any of the stuff that you used to do? Like, have you, have you, do, did you watch Stranger Things? Have you listened to the music? And do you hear any of your stuff possibly like as an influence to some of the stuff that those, what are, the, what are they called, the Duffer Brothers or whatever their names are? Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's, yeah, those are, the, those are the filmmakers. Yeah. And I don't remember if they, if they do the music too or is another group of brothers that do the music, but I know that no, they it's do. two guys that do the music, and I can tell you that in a second. Um, stranger things. I can tell you, everyone, IMDb is winding up. Here you go, filmmakers. Stranger Dead. But what's, um, well, I mean, if you listen, what's your opinion? Like, how do you, like, oh, yeah, yeah. Do you well, hear any you of know, that? Like, I hear, I hear what they're doing. It, it's like, <clears throat> okay, you can tell, I can tell that they are influenced by, I, I guess, the, the synth sounds of the 80s. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's all um, these were about, man. And they're kind of like, okay, it's Kyle Dixon and Michael Steiner. Okay, yep. the guys that do the okay. the, um, the the score to that. And uh, I'm sure you, I'm sure you know that. I, I mean, I got a call last year asking if they can use my music in the in the show, and I said, of course they can. My goodness, why do you have to ask? Well, so yeah. uh, they they use it like in the. Um, what do you call it? In the uh, the July Fourth, the first uh, oh yeah, premiere yeah. episode of season three. Yeah, yeah. I don't I, I don't know if they're gonna like you know show killer clowns from their street in the background. You know, some kids got the you rented the the VHS or something like that. That would be funny. But um, but anyway, you could just tell that they um, first of all they're using all the gear. Yeah, they do all analog. Like when they recorded, it's none we, of it's digital. We used back then. Which I, my, I tip my hat to them. I say, good for you. I don't have any more um, romanticism for using the old gear anymore. I, I just don't because it, um, as fun as it was to use, there was, uh, there were things that we had to put up with that um, uh, I don't want to put up with anymore. Right. You know, like like no, noise from like cable noise. Yeah. Board noise. Yeah. Um, sometimes you you come up with a, your own sound, especially some of the program, not the solid state, but the uh, yeah, some of the solid state uh, um, synthesizers like the uh, Oberheim OBX. You come up with a sound, and then after a while, it starts sounding different because <laughs> it's heating up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> the unit, it, and so sometimes you have to like get it on tape as soon as possible. You yeah. know, I mean, it's not like. It would be drastically different, but it's a, a different enough where, you, you know, hey, that's not giving me a hard on like it did a half an hour ago. <laughs> you know, it's slightly different, you yeah. know. Yeah. So, um, but my hat's off to them that they still do all that stuff that way because it's, you know, it's it's a lot of fun if you don't have to do a lot of complicated music mm -hmm. in a short amount of time. You know, that's my opinion. But, um but I like the sound. I, I like the sounds they get. It's like reminiscent. You hear it. Um, 
it, it's it's got that 80s synth sound, but it's not like they're trying to copy it verbatim because I I just I just listened to a score I did not because I had to but for legal reasons that I did um, shortly after Killer Clowns and I go my gosh it sounds so 80s <laughs> that it made me Fuck sick. Yeah. <laughs> I go. I hate those. I hate those brass sounds. I hate because I was trying to get a, a real brass sound, but you know, was that you can on only Snake get, Eater? You can only make it sound so real, right? And uh, but it was a lot of fun. It was a movie called Steel and Lace, oh, okay. and uh, it, it was like the female Terminator movie. So, uh, by the way, uh, back to Terminator. Or you know, I, I was very inspired by Brad Fidel what he did and i i kind of read in several magazine articles what he did where he took some of the standard samples and if the sa- samples played well let's say around if anyone knows the p- keyboard or the piano around middle c let's say there was a sound that was sampled in middle c but if you play it three octaves lower it sounds completely different and awful but in a great way <laughs> so i was kind of doing that also with my samples like in, there are some places in killer Clowns from outer space I would play the flute super low, and those would be my cellos and basses. Nice. But it's like a flute sample, but played very low, and it sounds like a cooler cello. So, um, so I was I had fun experimenting in in that respect. And they did a whole ton of other stuff that was that I don't think I ever did again. You know, <laughs> uh, it's like I, your own it's your own version of jazz. Yeah. 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 Jazz from Hell. <laughs> yeah, like Jazz a, from Hell. A Zappa album. Where, did you ever hear that one where he was doing, are you familiar with the Sinclair at all? Of course, yeah. In fact, uh, I didn't use the Sinclair, uh, no, no, wait a minute, no. Uh, for, um, I used the Fairlight, which was mm-hmm. the a competitive sampler to the um, to the Sinclair. Mm-hmm. But I know a lot of people that were Sinclair users, yeah. Very weird. I mean, it, it was it it was kind of it was really ahead of its time. But I mean, looking back on it now, just how much it would take to operate and get from point A to point B with that shit. You know, I right. I feel you. Like you're saying, if you if you're a guy who lived it back in the day, especially with orchestral pieces, it's it's a pain in the ass. You know, if you mm-hmm. it, it's a lot different. Say like for Black Sabbath to go in the studio and record now Manalog. I mean, it's they. Those mm-hmm. guys were pretty much had everything down to the point where they practiced mm-hmm. so much. They'd go, they record the song and get it. Usually one or two takes. But like, mm-hmm. even back in the day, a guy like Zappa, who uh, was not uh, necessarily pleased with what he did, or he was putting out a record where it was just strictly guitar solos, and we're talking analog. Mm-hmm. So he was cutting l- with a razor blade. You know what I'm talking about? Literally cutting sure. yeah. every piece of music and gluing it and taping it back together. And it's like, holy fuck, just to get that sound that you, you take for granted because you hear it on a CD or whatever. But, <laughs> you know, the manufacturing of that uh, track was just it's it's mind bo- mind boggling. Like, holy mm-hmm. shit. You know, that, that's why, why would anybody want to go back? Yeah, they had yeah. to live that. Yeah, that's that's why when There's I hear a lot like, of work in that. Yeah, There's a lot of work involved in that. Like when I hear when I, I read an article about the Stranger Things guys and and what they go through t- in order to to like capture that sound, and I'm like, how do you repeat that? Like, how do you make a certain sound repeatable? It, it's almost like impossible. But then I also hear like I'm a big fan of like Jack White, and he likes to do everything mm-hmm. like analog or like hey, this is how it's gonna sound. Mm-hmm. And if we were try to p- repeat this sound like uh, uh, on take two or three. Like it's not, it's going to be mm-hmm. totally different. And to me, I'm like, if you're a musician, and with a lot of musicians, it's all about accuracy mm-hmm. of the repeatability of like playing that piece over and over and over again, and like being mm-hmm. really fucking accurate with it. You know, uh, right. a, a, a couple years ago, it got out before like before YouTube really became like uh, what YouTube is. Um, the word mm-hmm. on the street was like Jerry Seinfeld was uh, used to collect these tapes of what's his name, the drummer. That that was like the the inspiration for the kid from Whiplash. Um, I'm messing it up. Some, anyways, but uh, but this dude that used to drum all the time, and he would like lay into his bandmates after every show because they weren't accurate. Uh, jazz drummer, yeah, mm-hmm. white dude, uh, right, yeah, right. Benny. Uh, no, um, God, I can't, Buddy Rich. Buddy, Buddy Rich. Rich. Yes, That's yes, exactly Buddy Rich. It. There's so, a movie yeah, out Seinfeld, about him. Yeah, Seinfeld used to collect these tapes of Buddy Rich. Going on the tour oh, bus, yell, 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 yes, and, and oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah, and the, yeah, and yeah. and now they're now you can go on YouTube and listen to these tapes, but that was like yeah, a, he's a, just like tearing people apart afterwards, right? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, because I, what, I, I I never understood. I I would. I, it's so funny because I used to see him, um, uh, Buddy Rich play at the Carnation Theater uh, in um, Disneyland. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and it just sounded so awesome. I can't imagine. You know, I guess. I couldn't hear what he heard as far as yeah. things not working out properly, but you're right. Um, well, well, let's put it this way. Um, here's, I did a commercial for um, the Walt Disney Company that was that heralded the um, the arrival of Epcot Park, of Epcot Center, in Walt Disney World, right? And this piece was to play in all the theaters. And then it was going to play on the Disney Channel. It was going to be just a big deal, right? And I did it with tons of analog synthesizers. I had all these stacked up things, and I mixed it a certain way. And just before I laid it on to tape, the uh, client came in, which was the um, <clears throat> the uh, graphic artist that put all the, the the animation together, which I later found out he had no say so final say so he shouldn't have even been there it was the producer that was going to approve everything anyway he heard it and he was blown away oh i love this i go okay great let me let me lay it down on tape for you so i laid it down on tape and i gave him a cassette and he listened to it and and sunk it up to the visuals and then he had some changes that he wanted to make so i go okay uh yeah okay let me let me just try to do that okay okay so I call up the studio and and I say because I had to rent out a studio, I'd like to come in with my gear again and uh, make some changes. And he goes, oh, he says we're doing an album for the next six months. We're booked. We're four walled. And I'm going, oh my god. So I had to find another studio, and I could never recapture the sound mm. again. Even even when I brought the tape in, and it played that tape that smoky track tape played at the new studio. And I told them basically this is how the mixer had it set up. And I had them call up the the uh, recording engineer at the other studio, and they you know he tried the best he could, and it just never sounded the same. And I ended up spending uh, two weeks working on that twenty second thing. What's this guy's name? <laughs> I'll find come, him. I'll choke yeah. him for and you. And then I found him. out the 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 six eight, or eight versions that I did. Mm. Um, the executive producer just picked one that he liked and that was it. No, we're not going to do anything. We're not going to do another version of this. We're just yeah. going to this version. Number four sounds perfect to me. So, but it was a nightmare trying to, to do that. That's why I'm such a fan of doing things in the box. So, <laughs> yeah, that's what I always wonder. Like when I hear certain, there's certain musicians where, where 100% it's cool to hear, especially if they're like a big live, like, like again, uh, if they're like a touring musician or somebody that wants to do a different version, like where it's cool to hear like a piece that might sound different in every place they might play it. Yeah. But if you're looking for mm-hmm. film or something that's that where it's going to be a permanent recording of something, you want it to sound it's like the way yeah. that it has like, like you're a musician, you write these things, you're a composer, mm-hmm. you have a sound in your head. And I'm sure there's days where hours become like every second might grind and feel like days to you because there's a certain sound in your head and you're killing uh-huh. yourself trying to replicate this thing that's in your head that is not real yet. And then when you right. find it and it's a real sound in the world that your ears just heard and you need to keep it. You need to keep it right. so that you can put it on tape so that other people can hear it and get and, and give their take. So like that whole process to me is um is like it actually is easier to do or much more achievable, I should say, not easier, but more achievable through digital, even though, you know, people might make the argument that analog is warmer, there's more life to it, blah, blah, blah. It breathes, yeah, that's cool, but like, you know, I, I, uh, yeah, there, there's certain, I don't know, like to hear it from, to hear it from your perspective, um, the pros and cons of things, I, I like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, earlier you said like, are you putting us to sleep? No, man, my like my wide my eyes are wide open. I love everything you're saying. It's, it's oh, cool. to, hear it, to hear it the way well, you're saying you know, it. it Addressing what you had just spoken about regarding you know uh, searching for the right sound. Uh, 
Vangelis has uh, Vangelis, who did you know you know who Vangelis is, right? He did um, Chariots of Fire and uh, Blade Runner, the okay. first Blade Runner movie. Yeah, he had he, he has a great um, uh, philosophy regarding that. Sometimes, uh, if you just dial up a sound, you know, on the synthesizer, or you're hunting through even the factory preset, and you start playing playing with them, all of a sudden that sound might inspire you to write a different music piece of music than if you were saying, okay, let me just pull up a piano sound. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. If you, you pull up something that sounds very odd and bizarre, and um, I think of that when I uh, hear uh, um, Paul McCartney's um, Hope You're Having a Wonderful Christmas Time. <laughs> There's this bizarre, <laughs> like a bizarre kind of like um, electric piano with a, you know, a stuttering uh, thing in it. You know, mm-hmm. uh, it's got some kind of weird bizarre delay built into the sample, and it's like I was just thinking, you know, I mean, you listen to it real close, you were going, hey, could you take out that annoying sound, you know? But no, it <laughs> it becomes part of the of the piece. Because right. it's so it's so unique, you know what I'm saying. So it's like um, so. There's that aspect too, where the uh, the sound is going to dictate the composition. And then you're right. There are some times where you, you want like some kind of a different kind of sustained sound that's going to hold. You know, going to have something to hold out a chord for. You know, 15, sixteen um, measures or like 25 seconds or something like that. It's got to be something that you know, people want to wrap around like a warm blanket, you know, something interesting. So then I have to find that warm blanket sound, you know, that, the, you know, you just, and somehow the hours tick by and you don't even realize it, you know, it's worse than playing a video game. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, whereas like, you know, whereas, whereas, by the way, uh, for the record, I don't play video games anymore, but for that very same reason. I anymore? What were you play, playing? My my video games, you probably never heard of them, but they were video games where you were a pilot and you were in various uh, conflicts, uh, historic conflicts, and you had to become good at it. And it like literally an entire day would disappear. And, um, you know, I thought, you know, there's more constructive things I could have done with my life in the, in the, the probably six months that I've lost. So I go in a prison, but um, <laughs> but in any event, uh, I'm I'm not not to bash video games, but it's just I don't think it's for me anymore. I, I think I did my time with video games. Although I have there's music of mine that's in video games, and I was I was actually working on uh, a video game last year that I I think it's come to a complete standstill. Uh, it has something to do I can't say what it is, but it has to do it's something like 007, but it's not 007. Uh, it's another franchise. Oh, but, naked, uh, naked was, gun then. Naked gun. <laughs> uh-huh. That would forty three, forty four to four. That would be a great video game, naked gun. <laughs> right. but it's not naked it kind of would. Yeah, so right. anyway, so uh, and that those anytime you take a, take a brand and try to make a video game of it, there's there's everyone and their brother comes out of the woodworks because there's all kinds of licensing rights. So yeah, <clears throat> a, a, a video game could take longer than a movie. Oh yeah, to produce. Yeah, lots of ins and outs of that. Um, so, I, I mean, obviously, other than Killer Clowns, which you guys just brought back uh, at the, what was it, the Universal, uh, the Halloween Horror Nights? Is that Universal, right? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Then that was this year. So this wasn't, this is... Yes, talking... that was this year. And the year before, they had done a scare zone, which I hear that people liked the scare zone. Uh, if, as much or if not more than the haunted house because the scare zone you can hang around there all day whereas the haunted house you had to wait in line for four, for an hour or so and then you get a five minute experience and there was more interaction with the clowns with the scare zone so I, that'd be really cool if they can bring it back as a scare zone next year but that was a great honor that was a lot of fun I met a lot of wonderful people uh, that were ju- they just you know uh, the movie embodies a certain amount of uh, of uh, good old fashioned fun and oddness and appreciation for the bizarre and uh, that's what that's what the haunted house was a celebration of. Hell yeah, that's very cool. Very very cool. 
Um, and what about a vinyl release of the Killer Clown soundtrack? Is that actually out well, yet? Well, you know, oddly, oddly enough, I just had a phone conversation with someone regarding that, and they uh, they told me to shut my mouth because they have to clear <laughs> some certain things before I can go ahead and do a vinyl release. Because uh, I I can do a, I think I I can tell you this I think I can do a vinyl release. Uh, it's easier for me to do a vinyl release of the of the reimagined score right. than it is of the first score. Right. Uh, and I can't even go into it about that, but uh, that's you. that's where it stands right now. So it's going to take a while for me before I before that's going to appear. Well, that's unfortunate because we need that shit on wax, John. <laughs> oh, I I agree. A hundred percent. But there's going to be a way to do it. You just got to figure out how to do it. You just got to figure out um, how to pay everybody that wants to be paid for it, right? Well, it's, I mean, it's I said that. Than, it's actually more than that. It's actually more than that. It's a bit more complicated. Mm-hmm. I mean, if I had to like talk about another product, like uh, let's say pick another brand of any, any sort of brand, let's say let's say Mission Impossible, and mm-hmm. let's say you wanted to do uh, a vinyl of the original uh, T. TV, um, all the TV music that Lawler Schifrin did of the first one. Uh, you just can't like say, oh, well, how much is it going to cost me as a licensing fee and start printing it out? There's there's um, there's the studio, the Par- I think it's Paramount originally, and then there's the uh, estate of the composer, and then there's the publisher, which may no longer be Paramount. It may have been bought by a different publisher. So all these three four entities have to be on the same page. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so th- this is this is what happens with things like that. That's why you just can't go out and, unless you bootleg something, you know, and then you're looking at a you're on the business end of a lawsuit, which is <laughs> never which is never I, I which I never want to be on the business end of a lawsuit. Right. And uh, so you just have to be very careful and make sure all the everything's uh, uh, lined up and set in place so that you can do it and then people can enjoy it doesn't get recalled or anything crazy like that so yeah it takes it takes a bit of uh, of doing to get things like that especially when a lot of time has gone by because Killer Clown ownership of Killer Clown the property the brand has changed owners over the years mm-hmm. at one point Universal Studios owned it yeah which is interesting and then Universal Studios had to license it from I believe from MGM in order to feature it at their amusement parks or something like something had to be done like that before they can get before it can happen so that's where but i'm i'm so impressed you guys haven't asked me the quintessential question because we're almost at the hour mark if i'm not mistaken you haven't asked me one particular question but i'm not going to tell you what that question is you know i'm just going to go with whatever your next uh, talking point is <laughs> Now I'm kind of curious. Curiosity, cue the cat. Yeah. Of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, um, I wanted to talk about a few other movies and projects that you've been a, a part of real quick here. Um, okay. One being Kickboxer, uh, Kickboxer 5, uh, so one of the sequels. <laughs> is that what it was called, Kickboxer? Part okay. 5. Part 5. <laughs> Let's start with Part 5. Is that it was that was the title of Kickboxer? Or did, wasn't something else besides Kickboxer? It was. It was. Right. Uh, I don't remember what the sub like. You know, there's. It was always... the one that Jean Jean Claude Van Damme was in, right? It well, he started that. Yeah, he started. So it he out. did the first one, and then Cody from uh, Step by Step. Yeah, Sasha. Yeah, Sasha, yeah. whatever his name was. And the one I did is the guy that's in Iron Chef. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, Mark DeCosco. He's a Filipino martial artist. Mark DeCosco. Yeah, right. <laughs> what, what a cool guy, by the way. Oh, what he's. A, I'm a huge fan cool of his. He is. Yeah, you got to meet him? Well, you worked with no, him. No, I didn't get to meet him, but I really appreciated everything I heard from the directors and producers about him. Oh, he's in the and, he's in the uh, the new John Wick, John Wick Part Three. He he plays the uh, the big the big martial arts baddie. I've been a, I've been a fan of his. Oh shit! Now probably for like thirty years. Yeah, huge fan of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and I am such a uh, a John Wick fan. Mm-hmm. I just I just love the whole John Wick series. I think it's just absolutely cool. 
And I, th- I wish the uh, John Wick and the Equalizer would do a, a movie together. That oh, would be- <laughs> man, that <laughs> that would be my that would be my fan fantasy. You know, have have that. But I can watch John. Wick. You know, it's funny when I watch John Wick. I don't pay attention to the score or anything. I just dig, totally dig. Um, Violence. Um, you know, Canal Reed's performance. Yeah. Oh, okay. You know, not not just the martial arts. Is like his like. Uh, he has a relationship with the guy who's the police officer that lives that patrols his neighborhood, which is really cool. Because they talk to each other as if like like the police officer comes to his house after there's been like a massacre, right? And he <laughs> yeah. goes, "Hi, John. Oh, hi, Gary. Um, what's going on? Oh, I'm just clearing up things. It's almost as if he said, "Hey, we're gonna go play baseball, John, at the park. You want to come play catch? And they're, like they're six year old." <laughs> <You know? laughs> that just like floors me. I mean, that is such a great, um, great aspect of the character and the story. But yeah. anyways, I'm, I'm now I'm starting to talk like it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. So you want to know about kickboxing? What is it you want to know about kickboxing? Uh, I just want to know how how it was to work. I, I'm a fan of the franchise. I even liked you know the shitty sequels. <laughs> All right. So that was uh, Kings Road Entertainment. And I can tell you that I was called in. I'll tell you the funny story about that. Um, Because doing the movie was the easiest part. That was the easiest part. I know how to to score the movie. I knew what to do. It's the politics that was the toughest part of that movie. Hmm. Because the movie had, uh, they had scored it with someone else and totally tanked. Whoever scored it, I have no idea who scored it, but it totally tanked. They, (laughs) They test screened it. And it's rare that an audience will say the music is really distracting and ruining it for me, right? That so someone came in and says, "Listen, we we got to replace the score. We have no money." And I go, "Well, tell me what no money is." You know, and they quoted me a price. I said, "Well, if you can make it closer to this figure than that figure, we've got a deal. We can get this done." So uh, someone approved it. Then the owner of the company, and I forgot his name. Uh, but the owner of Kings Road Entertainment and I had like a duel almost. Uh, I had come to see him at his office and he says, you know what? I have this box of tapes right here, a box of cassettes. I'm going to go through them. And we're g- you're going to pick out a cassette. You're going to pick out the cassettes for me and we're going to play them. And I'm going to tell you what I, that I like that composer. Cause to be quite honest with you, I heard your music. I don't like any of it. And I go, <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> But I'm stuck with you now. Yeah. So I go, okay. So I look into this box, and you know, I thought it was going to be like 40, like tons of tapes. There was like eight cassettes. Three of them were mine. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I kept pulling out mine. I, I play a little part. I go zip. And back then, I knew how far to go to get one piece. I play a piece of music. He goes, all right, that's working. Now, so you know why this works? Why? Because it has this and has that thing going on. I go, okay, good. And it's going another. So we did this for half an hour. He thinks I'm playing like the eight different ones, and I knew I, I could see the other cassettes, the uh, who they were, and they were all guys that I know. But I didn't play theirs, right? So he goes. Uh, so finally, at the very end, he goes, he goes like that. That is spot on. That is absolutely spot on. Let me see who that score is. I go, here, let me tell you. I handed it to him, and it had my name on it, and he just, like, got so angry at me. He said, <laughs> screamed every curse word at the book, in the book. You sw- you took that from your pocket. No, it was in your box. You were probably listening to it. You never just saw my name. So I got the extra little money that I needed to get it done. And um, But that was, that was like, a, that took an hour. And it was, it was so, I had so much fun doing that. And uh, that's a story I will tell to my grandchildren. So then I got the movie and it's been doing the movie was easy. Yeah. Doing the movie was actually really easy. The director, I forgot her name, but she's, she was really good. Let me look up Kickboxer 5, I think, right? Yeah. yeah and right. I don't think she's done anything after that. I think she retired. She probably had to though. After I mean, yeah, Kickboxer yeah. Five, the movie. Oh no gosh, one Kickboxer, for. Kickboxer Two. Uh, oh, and they is. rebooted Redemption. it. They just rebooted 1995, it. Nineteen ninety-five. Redemption. Van Damme came Christine back for the Peterson. last two. Christine Peterson. She was a lot of fun to work with. She really knew what the heck she was doing. Uh, I think the last movie she did, I worked on her movie after that was Slaves to the Underground, which was a, 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 a quintessential indie film. But anyways, she was a lot of fun to work with. 
And um, <laughs> so that's it. I don't know what else to tell you about that. Uh, what about um, uh, we, 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 uh, I, I dug the martial the martial arts in it was pretty good. The story was kind of you know was was good. It was shot in South Africa, and um, apparently the guy that was the main bad guy was mm-hmm. uh, was really a big deal in South Africa. Uh, as far as um, I think he was like a big time soap opera star or something like that. <laughs> so uh, I, I bet it did well in South Africa. I bet it did. John, what can you tell me but about? Did you uh, guys like it? I don't think I've seen it other than man, the time it's, I worked on it. You know what? To be honest with you, I I think I did, and the last time I seen it was probably on like USA Up All Night, like in the nineties or something. Um, right. I didn't mind the sequels. They were okay. But, I mean, obviously, it's not going to be the original Kickboxer, which was badass, but uh-huh. I enjoyed it. I'll have to go back and watch it again. Cause so I, I grew up, for whatever reason, my friends, I dragged them all into watching uh, what we referred to as low-budget karate movies. But all the – so they had, like, American martial artists, and they'd sprinkle in, like, Billy Blanks did a bunch of movies, like King of the Kickboxers and stuff like that. Uh-huh. And, uh, and back then – and. So the kick, kickboxer series, just like uh, there was another series with a with a kickboxer named uh, ah, I can't remember his name right now, um, but uh, but I remember I was a huge fan of Van Dam, and then when where they kind of like they kind of killed that character off to make more kickboxer stuff, and I was like I'm not right. watching it. Van Dam's not in it. But then when I found out that now, the dude kickboxer, and now they didn't now. So you're a fan of kickboxers now. Where you say that you can put you you can probably I couldn't do this you can probably point to movies and say well that's a I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right that's a Muay Thai uh, fighter yeah. there or that's yeah. uh, you know or, or yeah. a full on mixed martial arts guy yeah but that. you know it's what like, back then back then when we watched it it was all kind of mixed in because like Billy Blanks did like he was a legit like kickboxer there was dudes that did Muay Thai kickboxer was called kickboxer but it was supposed to be based around Muay Thai. But it was all like just, uh, I mean, Van Damme did a movie like the original Kickboxer was a Muay Thai movie, but he's not a Muay Thai guy. Even like Muay Thai is about kneeing people and elbowing people. And he was doing uh, flying, spl- like he would do the splits hey, in the don't air. don't talk about how he does the splits and where right. he does them. And I so love it. it wasn't like none of it was actually like accurate. You're just watching these. I was always drawn to the fact that um, these martial artists, like the acting was terrible. There's always a token strip club scene. All the bad yeah, guys were yeah. aviator sunglasses, yeah. and like there yeah. were certain tropes in each one of them. Um, mm-hmm. So, so it wasn't until I found out that that actor, uh, like, was in a mainstream American TV show that I went back to the Kickboxer series, and then I started watching those, right. and I was like, "Holy shit, this dude's like, he's Legit. pretty good. Like, he can do the thing." So, because um, he was Cody on the step by step, was just like, yeah, and I was just really like, I, I was impressed by the fact that this guy, like, oh look at him, he got he got like a role in an American television show, but he did four sequels to a film that I was a huge fan <laughs> right. of, you know. But, <laughs> but that that time during the eighties and then like the mid nineties, I remember having like uh, a bunch of posters in my basement of like Cynthia Rothrock was like a forms champion for Kung Fu. And she did a mo- bunch right. of movies. She was, a, like, she was a she was in a good number of movies. Yeah, yeah. And and I remember actually like she did a uh, for, I don't know what the point because she's an American woman, but she did China O'Brien one and two, <laughs> and I I had posters of her like in my basement and like like well, yeah. The O'Brien part is a clue. Yeah, <laughs> and I I don't know why, but I loved that shit, and I even like. That was kind of like I always big into the music, but with those, there was a certain there's even a certain type of way to score those films um, where they mixed mm-hmm. in like that, like a lot of like I guess electronic drum stuff, like Sheena Easton type right. of drum stuff, mixed in with a little bit of like Asian flair, like what would be stereotypical. Like I don't even know if it's traditional Asian music, but what I guess Americans mm-hmm. would think Asian music was. And they would throw right. that in there, and I just I loved it. I mean, I remember Van Damme did a movie called No Retreat, No Surrender, mm-hmm. and the main mm-hmm. like he was the main bad guy, and the main good guy was trained by the ghost of Bruce Lee, and it was an oh wow American film produced by like I think uh, Golden Harvest or one of the Chinese companies, and I used to mm-hmm. love that shit, and I loved the music to it. I liked everything about it, but for for like a you know a twelve year old or a fourteen year old kid. Like back in the eighties and nineties, there was no reason for me to like that crap, <laughs> but I did. Well, and- I, uh, growing up here in the wilds of Orange County near Disneyland, there was a growing uh, uh, 
a very vibrant Asian community. Yeah. And in the in the dollar theaters, uh, they would have uh, all these great um, uh, kung fu movies from China that you know were were like you know the they're dubbed into English by people in Australia. They're trying to sound American, and, <laughs> yeah. and they were just the martial arts was just and sound effects was just so awesome in those. And I could watch three or four of those in a row like, with no problem, you know. Oh yeah, Samurai so. Sunday for me was where it was at as a kid. And Bruce Lee, you know what? I just got through watching uh, Tarantino's new film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which is a great. Oh, film. I gotta see that. I gotta see that. Supposedly the guy that played Bruce Lee did a really awesome job. He did. Is that true? He did, but uh, I could I could definitely see where uh, Bruce's daughter Shannon was offended by it because they made Bruce seem like some some pompous asshole. The some that oh yeah. Out of all the that's, studying yeah, I've done, good. I I've never seen anything that would render Bruce as a, as the character he was portrayed in that. So I was kind of like, damn it! I love everything yeah. about this movie and the way he's playing him. But that. that so yeah, that's that's that's. Uh, because I've probably seen just about every Bruce Lee interview that he's done. And he just he's so consistent and spot on. Yeah, he's, he he was wise. You know, I mean, he was a a philosopher. Yeah. He was he was just a dude trying yeah. to figure out the best way to get his his vibe and his point across, and in really in a positive manner. You know. So I, John, mm-hmm. I have I have one more question because we're we're like well past one hour, but I have one more question. Okay, and I'm gotcha. sure. And I'm sure Wallace has a couple more, but Is I it do about have Puppet one. Master? It's not about Puppet Master. It's oh. actually about, um, like, what uh, what type of music do you listen to when you're not on the job? Like, what do you listen to? Do, what do you say Damn in the it. shower? What are you listening to in the car? Like, uh, well, I could uh, I, most recently I, I discovered um, uh, Radiohead. Okay, uh, and I've been listening to. Um, a song of theirs that I just really like, and and I and I saw a video of a live performance of the song, um, and I I I, I want to say it's called No Surprises, mm-hmm. um, and then there's um, something like a, a, a song like In Its Own Place, Everything in Its Place, something like that. Uh, I just really liked it. It just really hit home. I. I um, yeah, and that's it, it, every everyone everything in the right place. It's a really cool song, um, and um, I like um, Cascade and um, Dead Mouse. Oh, yeah. Um, also, also um, and I met him not too long ago. Um, anything that Trent Reznor does, I, I really like. Nice. Uh, yeah, what did I, he I really just like score? He just did uh, what for some. Oh, the Watchman! I think he's doing Watch- HBO's Watchman yeah, TV series. Yeah, he did the yeah. Watchman. He works with uh, Atticus Ross, who's, who's mm-hmm. really um, who who uh, who's music I also like. Nice. So, um, do, I mean, do I sit down and listen to that? It, it's funny. The last thing that I just listened to recently um, that I just had to listen to was um, "Hocus Pocus" by Focus. <laughs> um, it's, oh are you familiar with that? It's a, it's a, a Swedish band, a Swedish metal band in the seventies, and I wanted to listen to their original uh, recording, and not the live performance. And it was just so awesome to listen to it, like on headphones, uh, because I remember when I was a kid, I used to listen to it on the on the car radio. And they're called. And Focus? it was a great song. It's called Focus by a group called Hocus. I Hocus, know I've heard Hocus Pocus. Which is a I know Swedish band. I, I listen to a yeah. lot of Swedish bands. There's actually a big resurgence with like, uh, I guess like the classic metal or the doomy metal, like Sabbath mm-hmm. type stuff. There's a lot of bands out there right. like Witchcraft and Graveyard um, that are really mm-hmm. killer bands from out there that have that retro sound. And it's got like that right, feel. Right. If you didn't know any better, you'd swear like this album's thirty years old or something. You know, forty years old. Yeah, and then and then um, and what's another thing that you know? There's certain things I I loved when I was a kid, and I, I, I would listen to them on the radio, mm. and I want to listen to them now. You know, in a great in a sonic environment. Right. And uh, also, I listen to um, 
uh, two albums by um, Boyster Cole. Nice, yeah. It, it's funny. My girlfriend's yeah. dad used to run with those guys back in the day. Oh man, right. And they they just they just had a great. You, and you you know listening to them, them now, you can hear they they do actually have um, um, like a classic. They have a classical uh, form and orchestration yeah. to their to their uh, uh, to their songs. There's um, you know that, that you know just you know don't fear the reaper is just like the tip of the ice iceberg. You know right. Um, but there's uh, secret treaties. There's um, um, gosh, what's the name of some of the albums? I remember secret treaties was one of them. Um, but I remember I was in a band that we used to play their music and uh, some places that we um, <clears throat> would play it. Says you can't, we can't play this. We saw the lyrics to that song. We can't have it. I go, why? There's a song called a, a career of evil. Mm-hmm. I go, well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> I never, and then I read the lyrics finally and, and I'd be singing along. I wasn't really paying attention to, I don't know where my mind was, but I'm not paying attention to the subject matter of the lyrics it's like the music that's really cool. Yeah. And so, oh, God, these are horrible lyrics. Really <laughs> hey, I'll say, Tom. I'm just living a career of evil. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, like Ronnie James Dio. The Harvester of Eyes. Oh, my gosh. That's like, you know. So there were certain songs that, um, there were certain places that we played in high school that they had to see the lyrics of the songs to see if they were in keeping with, you know, 13 year olds, you know. So. Do you do. Uh... Okay. Uh, orchestra and stuff in high school? Oh, yeah. I played uh, trumpet. I played the contrabass. Nice. So were you in I jazz band percussion. at all? I played French horn and um, uh, tenor horn, or it's called a euphonium. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I played that in college, too, in college band. Nice. Very, very nice. I like that. I played jazz band in uh, orc. Uh, I guess you would call it. It was we didn't really have like orchestra in high school, but it was mm-hmm. like a concert band is what they would call it. So it was, oh yeah, yeah, with symphonic band, right? Yeah, symphonic, right. yeah. yeah. So did you? Uh, what did you play? Uh, I well in symphonic concert band, I actually did guitar in both, and then uh, oh, a cool. little bit of percussion because when I w- I walked in the band, I was just like a guy. I had a guitar. I like punk rock and like metal and stuff, and. Like I said, I had that huge Zappa background, so I was just learning. So for me to go into it, uh, I believe it was sophomore year of high school, and they threw me right in the jazz band. I didn't know how to read charts or anything. It was probably one of the scariest moments of my life, where it's like you're sitting with everybody who knows, and these, like, you know, in high school at that level, like, that's the highest point in band you can get to. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm, I shit you not, I'm sweating bullets, and I'm like, Oh man, if I just turn it down and act like I'm fucking comping some chords, you know, they won't know. And, uh-huh. You know, long story short, it took a little bit, but uh, once I caught on and really learned how to like read the charts and everything, I, I right. really miss jamming with a band, uh, you know, especially like the woodwind and the brasswind and having that uh, rhythm section there. Like we we did some cool stuff. There's some stuff on YouTube where we did like fanfare. For the common man, but it was like a seventies oh, like wow. funk, like and it had like bass slapping solos. Our drummer, this kid, was like fifteen or sixteen at the time, and it was like, holy shit, is that like Puerto Rican John Bonham behind the kit? You know, like right. It it, it was just it was very cool because it was it was a bunch of kids, and we had uh, we actually had um, our jazz instructor was a guy who like judged West Montgomery down in Indianapolis, like way back in the day. I don't know wow. if you're familiar with him. Wow. Um, wow. So, and this guy just, he lived, breathed, slept, and drank jazz music. And he had, he just had a passion that he passed on to his students. And so long story short on that, like I, I just, I really miss playing with that and being a huge Zappa fan and seeing how he could blend in guitar and rock music and doo-wop and all this shit that I would like to incorporate. Cause I do like a lot of different music. Um, but then uh-huh. to have what I call like the original um, instruments there, like your, your woodwind and your brasswind, your I, horns. I love that shit. I mean, there's even the right, sound. Right. If you go back to Soundgarden, Bad Motorfingers record, um, I mean, there's trumpets and horn on that. And it's fucking amazing Yeah, because it fits with this yeah, band yeah. that's like 
an amalgam of Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath. Like, how does it work? I don't know, but it sounds great, you know? Uh-huh, so, yeah, uh-huh. that was my little uh, foray. And then I got into uh, singing crazy death metal, you know, stuff and whatever. Yeah, I love that, too. I love that, too. Do you really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, I don't write it or play it, but I like listening to it. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it's it's good. Yeah. It's a I think a, a common misconception with a lot of people is like, well, if you listen to that, you're you're doing the devil's work, or and it's it's like no, I mean, <laughs> it, it's like watching a movie. You know, you, you watch a horror right. movie, and maybe like even if you go back to like extreme shit, like Lucio Fulci or something like that, that's just like all this crazy gore and all this weird right. shit happening that shouldn't happen in normal society. But you, it's entertainment. You know, people have to separate right. themselves. And it's the same thing with, like, death metal and a lot of that. And people have this misconception that, like, well, the people that listen to this are bad or they're crazy. And it's like they are, hey, if you actually talk to them, they're some of the nicest people you'll ever meet. They're, you know, they're oh, calm. Course, yeah. like, But it, it's just, it's that release. I love listening to that shit, you know. And, and, and getting up there and playing it is a totally different animal. And, and to have that all come out and, and people actually dig it. And whether they dig it or not, because that's kind of where the punk side comes in. It's like, oh, fuck you. It's more for us than it is for you. But if you like it, thank you, you know. And actually have people that get that. I, You know, I remember playing um, a few shows where we would be up on stage and we would do our thing. And it would be intense and fast and brutal and crazy. And then afterwards, it's just like, hey, man, you know, we just want to kick back and, like, have a beer and chill. And I remember having people come up mm-hmm. to me and, like, Wow, you're like a totally different person off stage. Like, it's like, well, hey, man, I'm just, I'm just a dude, you know. Like, I, I like that crazy stuff, you know. I like Campbell Corpse and Death and Obituary and all that. But what do, you, what do you, what should, what should I be doing? You know, it's like, no, no, nothing like that. He's like, I just, I get it, man. I, I like shook the guy's hand. I'm like, thank you. You know, it's, it's just there. It's another form of expression. So, I appreciate that you enjoy it as well, John. Yeah, I do. I do. Um, so John, real quick, tell people where they can find you at online. Well, online, uh, I'm most active on Instagram. So it's just, if you look up John, sorry, composer on Instagram and I'm on Facebook too. Um, I believe that's John dot Masari, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. John dot Masari on, on Instagram. I think I'm the only one. You are. Uh, there's a, uh, and, uh, so they can see me there. You, Come friends with you can ask me any question you want you can ask the question that you guys did not ask today and i'm really impressed that you didn't ask um you did not ask when there will be a killer clown sequel uh, you know what here's the thing that that is the question <laughs> i had a feeling and i was gonna probably a half hour 40 minutes into us talking i was gonna suggest gonna ask, that right? i was gonna and i ask will him. tell you this if you want if you want a killer clown sequel uh, you have to contact MGM, and uh, because just like the um, just like the uh, the scare zone and the haunted house came to mm-hmm. be at Universal Studios is because the fans demanded it. Right. So, in, with the same talking, the uh, you know if you, if you, and there's a, a lots of venues fans can interact with MGM. Say hey, we would like to see a Killer Clowns movie, and we want the Kyoto Brothers to produce it, and we want John Masari to do the score. You know, you get a hundred thousand people doing that; they, 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 they kind of stand up. So that's where we're at with that. <laughs> Very awesome. That would be cool. But I will. I'm going to shoot with you real quick. Bang bang. Okay. Uh, wrestling terminology. Hey. That's what we call. <laughs> um, I, you know what? As much as I would love that. And I, I just would love for some studio to be like, fuck it, like this is a property because that's what a lot of their what they're doing now is they see Batman or they see whatever movie that has been done a million times. Well, we know we can make right. money off of this. So let's just do that. And I really don't right. see, I don't see how they don't see Killer Clowns as like a a property that could sell, especially nowadays. Um, but I'm gonna shoot straight with you. I, as much as mm-hmm. I love that original movie, I don't know if I'd want to see a straight up sequel. Not, not uh-huh. be, right, right. because it is that, I, you know I, what I I'm saying? You, you taint what what it originally was, you know? I mean, don't get me wrong. Yeah. I would love to see where it goes. I, I do. I would like to see that. But at the same time, yeah. man, it's just, it is its own thing. And it, and it really kind of is timeless to me. 
And that's just my right. opinion. I don't want to see anybody bastardize it, <laughs> you know? Like, if it's going to be done right, right, yes, get all you guys back together and do it right, and I will be on board. But if no one's willing to do that and they're just like, hey, we want to remake it and purchase the rights to remake it, fuck off. Yeah. Right. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, there are some, some sequels that, oh, wow, this is a great continuation of the story and then uh, or a, a, a great um, – a great experience and there's some that you go well yeah. i don't know what that was that i just saw yeah you let know? me put it to you this it way doesn't have, doesn't have the magic of the original imagine you know? 2020 forrest gump 2 <laughs> yeah <laughs> why is it happening like did it yeah, yeah, happen to a movie yeah. that's like that good yeah. and, and to me that's how killer clowns is you know in its own regard is it is what it is right. and i fucking love it and it's it's right. a classic well, there's a lot of classic films, uh, horror films, that have not gotten uh, a proper sequel, in my opinion. I mean, oh, yeah. you know, um, you know, like Ghostbusters. It, the, when I have not seen any other, uh, I loved the first round of Ghostbusters, and I, I just had no desire to see any of the sequels. No, you know, I couldn't get off of. Uh... Just ha- I just have. That's, that's me personally. You know, yeah. there was magic in those two, and I tell you the honest truth, if they did a killer. Back in the day, they did a Killer Clowns and then did a sequel after. You know, we did them relatively, you know, a couple of years, a year or two apart. Mm-hmm. And we went through and we finished, said all we, I, I, I would be satisfied then yes. because we were like, it was, it was like, uh, it, the momentum was there. Right, right. And, and I think if we do it now, and especially if the Kyoto Brothers do it, uh, because no one has been able to, uh, copy the um, uh, the style of the masks that the killers can come up with, and their style of uh, you know um, you know when they do the um, not only the effects, visual effects, but the the crazy slapstick, which yeah. they do very well. Because don't forget the Kyoto brothers are puppet performers. Yeah. So in, in, in being a performer, they, they're very good at directing people. To be performers, so uh, I, I I happen to think that when, 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 if we do another permutation of Killer Clowns from Outer Space, it's going to be different, but it's going to be a lot of fun, you know. Yeah, well, as long like I said, as long as you guys are uh, all on board, it it'll satiate mm-hmm. my appetite. I, I will tell you that. And it's funny that you just said Ghostbusters because I literally just seen the trailer today for Ghostbusters Aftermath, Go, Ghostbusters oh, is that Three. What it's called? Yeah, so they're they're wiping the one with all the women out of the way. I don't know if that's a good thing to say in 2019 or not, but it appears uh-huh. that they're just like that's its own thing and down by the wayside. Right. Um, but yeah, it's got so this one is of the a kids. New universe. Well, yeah. Well, this is it. Actually, ties in. Um, and it's weird because it's like, how can they do that without you know? Uh, was it Harold Ramis? Um, who uh-huh. was a big part, I believe. What was it? it was him and the Dan Aykroyd that wrote it, right? Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. So with him gone now, unfortunately, it's like, how do, how do you do that? Uh, they do make reference to the, the main character, which is one of the Stranger Kids from Stranger Things. Stranger Kids. Right. That's a creepy kid. Um, they make reference to, he's like, well, my dad died. You know, my mom's gone, and he's living with somebody. Uh-huh. And then they're in this old barn. He uncovers Ecto-1 and all this. I think Paul Rudd's in the movie, and all this creepy shit uh-huh. starts happening. And in, the, in this trailer, they do not show any of the old Ghostbusters, which I've heard they're supposed to be in it. You know, I think they're interesting. They're writing it, but yeah, check it out when you get a second. It's called a uh, Ghostbusters Aftermath. Uh huh. Yeah, I'll have to ask some friends of uh, friends and acquaintances of mine. They're big fans. They're such fans that they belong to various chapters of of Ghostbuster people that they they do birthday parties and. Um, they, they go to schools and then uh, uh, and various charitable events, and dressed as all the characters <laughs> with like full full gear, you know, like very sophisticated, you know. <laughs> uh, I got I got I wonder what their uh, feedback is going to be like. That'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah, it'll it'll be uh, very interesting to see where that goes. Well, John, I thank you very much, man. I, it was an absolute fucking pleasure to talk to you. And uh, if well, thank you very much, too. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you hanging out with you guys. Too bad we weren't like in in per you guys are in Indiana, correct? Yeah, correct. 
yeah, too bad we what's the what's the favorite local beer in Indiana? Um, well we do I'm glad you brought that up because now I can plug them again. We do have the best brewery in all of the world, uh, called Three Floyds. Um have you ever wow. have you ever had any Three Floyds beer? Three Floyds beer? No, but I will I will look it up. They uh Dark Lord Day is or well Dark uh, Lord I should say, is their absolute special I, I've seen a lot of uh, international and national awards where they're always in first place with the Dark Lord. Zombie Dust, if you like mm-hmm. IPAs, mm-hmm. is is great. They, they they're really cool because they got kind of like this underground metal vibe. They do a lot of collaborative work with uh, bands, like you know we were talking about like uh-huh. Cannibal Corpse and stuff like that. Uh, and they do they put on this big fest called Dark Lord Day, which draws people from everywhere, and it's insane because like. They give you a couple bottles of this stuff, which they only make once a year, and it goes for an insane amount of money. Like in the in the aftermarket, the beer aftermarket, um, because it is that damn good. So mm-hmm. check them out. I, I I did see you were okay. posting. Uh, so you're a beer guy. You got to be right. I, I I like I I I I'm, when it comes to drinking, I'm I'm a cowboy drinker. It's got to be either beer or straight liquor. Oh, I like that. I like I'm that. I'm not into. I'm. I'm not into anything. I mean, I'm not a big drinker, uh, by the, by any stretch of the imagination. But when I do, Social it's got to be straight. It's got to be straight whiskey. I, I'm not into mixed drinks. But Same. I will tell you here. This is going to be an odd uh, 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 thing for me to say for some people. But um, uh, the Budweiser Brewery is very close to uh, where I live. And uh, I know the days that they deliver fresh, like they oh. brewed it, bottled it, and delivered it. I know my local grocer tells me the days that they're making the delivery. Oh. Budweiser, it, uh, when it's fresh, is oh. really good. Hey, I'm gonna let you on a little it's... trade secret here at the JP Dub. <laughs> I I, I, pound, uh-huh. I pounded two Budweisers while we were talking. Oh well, that's good. Uh, I love go. it. <laughs> Budweiser is my go-to man. That's uh. Bud Heavy, yeah, that's, that's my favorite man. Long yeah. live the king. Know what I mean? Baby? And in Dodger Stadium, you know they they get they get brewed and delivered to a oh. game, and we, you can go to like there's a place outside the stadium. It's like a big outdoor bar. Mm. They have it fresh there. It's uh, off the tap, fresh. It's, oh. it's so different than if you get it in oh. a can that's been sitting around for three months. Man. There is a big difference. I have no idea what happens, but. I just know that when you get it fresh, it's good, and it's made here in America. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, even though it's owned by InBev, which is, I believe, a Swedish company, <laughs> which is kind of well, weird. Well, the Swedes know what they're doing. Yeah, you know? yeah, they do. Them well, and listen, the... guys, uh, this has been a real honor. I really appreciate hanging out. Maybe one of these days I'll be doing something at a convention um, in the um, uh, in in your neck of the woods in the Midwest, and we can hang out for real. Yeah, man, and uh, hey, we you know we're close to Chicago. So if you ever find minutes. yourself near Chicago, you let us know. We'll uh, we'll take you to a couple of nice it. restaurants, and uh, you could uh, we'll give you a little tour of some of the. Uh, so anything around Lake Michigan is known now in the brewery world for having really good beers. Yeah. So yeah, there's a cool. bunch of there's a bunch of good shit around here, and good. There's a reason why the middle of America is fat as hell. <laughs> like we got some good food. <laughs> Well, Sretton, you'll be—I uh, think you'll be on Cali here soon, right? Yeah, I'll be, be in. San Diego. I'll be in San Diego next weekend. Um, so oh, cool! I'm hoping, cool. I'm hoping to well, stop at Stone Brewery for the first time. So that's cool. Uh, All right, guys. Well, thank you very much. Is thanks, there a sign off that you guys usually do? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there is. Are you ready? <gasps> okay, I'm ready to hear it. Wet, Wet em up. up! Wet em up! Wet, Wet em up! up. Wet You gonna do sex to me?